Here's lots of applications of vector spaces, but they tend to be a little bit long, so I'm going to look at two of them. I may end up splitting this into two videos, we'll see. Uh, I'm going to look at rotating conics and Ronskians, because I like Ronskians and they sound cool, and I like rotating conics. So let's take a look at those two. So the first of the big applications I'm going to look at are rotating conics. Now remember what a conic section is? We're talking about things like circles, ellipses, and so forth. If I have a standard ellipse, right, it'll fit nicely this way or maybe horizontally. But if I were to take that axis and rotate it, so what if it were not centered at the x and y axis? What if I rotated my axis like this? And it still had a major axis and a minor axis, but maybe instead of being like the first drawing, it was like the second drawing. So it was a horizontal rotated by that angle theta. So all conics have this form. You've got your x squared term. You may have an xy term. You've got a y squared term. You've got an x term. You've got a y term. And you've got a constant, and it's set equal to zero. So that's a general form for a constant. If it has an xy term, in other words, if b is not equal to zero, then it's rotated by theta. Probably up until this point, all the conics that you've done have not had an xy term. Because I suspect that the conics that you've graphed have looked more like the first one than the second one, where it's either on the vertical axis or the horizontal axis, but it's not on some tilted axis. This is the first round of rotating conics. Later in the course, we're going to look at conics rotated again through a slightly different method. So if it does have an xy term, so if it is rotated, it's going to be rotated by an angle theta that follows this formula. The cotan of 2 theta equals a minus c over b. Now you notice that if b is equal to 0, the problem ends because you're going to have a cotan that's undefined, and now you're back to vertical horizontal. But if that b is not zero, then that formula holds. Well, we're going to achieve this by changing our bases. So the standard basis for this conic would be ij, right? So the standard basis would be 1, 0, and 0, 1. Right? So our new basis. is going to have the basis vectors cosine theta, sine theta. That comes from the unit circle. All right, so this comes from the unit circle. Now, if I rotate it 90 degrees, what am I going to end up with? Because the original axes were vertical and horizontal. So even if I rotate them like this, they still have to be perpendicular to each other. So if this is cosine theta, sine theta, move it over here. What am I going to end up with? Well, remember, sine and cosine are complementary. So if you rotate them 90 degrees, they're going to switch, right? They're going to switch from cosine sine to sine cosine, but with one little difference. If I move from quadrant 1 to quadrant 2, it's going to change the coordinate of my first value. So instead of it being the same as the sine, it's going to be the same as the opposite of sine. So it's going to be negative sine theta, cosine theta, where theta is the angle that I rotate those things. In order to convert between the two of them, I'm going to need a transition matrix. So how do I set up that transition matrix? Well, we want to go from the old to the new. So the new one goes first. So let's work on a transition matrix. Go down the columns, cosine theta, sine theta. And then the other one will be negative sine theta, cosine theta. And then 1, 0, 0, 1. Really what I want to do is I want to find the inverse of this. So yeah, I can row reduce, but it's going to get messy multiplying things by sines and cosines. So if I can find the inverse of that matrix, then I'll have my transition matrix. How do I find the inverse? Well, the first thing is I need the determinant of that matrix. So the determinant is going to be cosine squared theta minus a negative sine squared theta. Oh, how nice. The determinant is 1. So it turns out that if I want the transition matrix, then all I have to do 
is switch things around. Well, I don't even have to switch these things around, right? Cosine theta and cosine theta remain the same. That negative sign becomes a positive sign. That positive sign becomes a negative sign. And so when I multiply that by xy, I want to produce x prime y prime. So these are the values of x and y relative to the new basis. And so what I'm going to want to do is set up an equation for this conic in terms of x primes and y primes. All right, so sort of follow the bouncing ball. If you do matrix multiplication here, you'll end up with x times the cosine of theta plus y times the sine of theta equals x prime. And you'll end up with negative x times the sine of theta plus y times the cosine of theta equals y prime. All right, I would like to solve for x and for y. Not going through the whole process, the top row I'll solve for x, the bottom row I'll solve for y. So, sort of a little hand-waving and solving for x and y, we come up with these equations. We come up with x equals x prime times the cosine of theta minus y prime times the sine of theta, and we get y equals x prime times the sine of theta plus y prime times the cosine of theta. Our goal then is to take some conic equation that's written in terms of x's and y's and replace those x's and y's with these x primes and y primes. And eventually, then we'll have to substitute those sine theta and cosine thetas with values that we got from that cotan of two theta equation. Let's look at this example. This example is going to get a little messy, then it's going to get a little non-messy, and it'll be nice and pretty in the end. So let's take a look at this example. I've got a conic given by 5x squared minus 2xy plus 5y squared minus 24 equals 0, and my goal is to describe it and graph it. So what do our values look like? That's A, that's B, that's C. There's no X term and there's no Y term by itself, so there's no D and no E. That's my F. All right, so I gave you that massive equation at the beginning. These conics will not always have a representation of each and every one of them. First thing I'm going to do is I want to find the rotation angle. And so what's my formula? My formula is that the cotan of 2 theta equals A minus C over B. So I end up with 5 minus 5 over negative 2, which is 0. Well, if the cotan of 2 theta is equal to 0, then where is the cotan equal to 0? Well, the tangent is equal to 0 at 0, so if you move it over, that must mean that the cotan is at pi over 2. So the cotan of pi over 2 is equal to 0. If you think of the cotan graphs, the cotan graphs shift over from tangent, so you end up with graphs that go like this. And so this is now pi, this is pi over 2, right? So the pi over 2 is from tangent, shift over to pi, and now that becomes a zero mark. So if 2 theta is equal to pi over 2, then theta must be pi over 4. So pi over 4 is my angle of rotation. The next thing I want to do is I want to turn those sines and cosines into constant values, because that'll make things a little bit easier. So my second step is to substitute into sine and cosine. So I end up with the sine of pi over 4. Sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Cosine of pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. Okay, so in this case, it makes it a little bit easier because they're the same coefficients. Will it always be that way? No, no. But in this case, first time around with this, let's keep this kind of simple. All right, now my next step is 
to find substitutions for x and y. So find expressions, probably a better mathematical term, for x and for y. So we're told that x is equal to x prime cosine theta minus y prime sine theta. Well, the cosine of theta we set up here was root 2 over 2. So I get cosine of theta is root 2 over 2. Sine of theta is also root 2 over 2. Ah, how nice. So I can replace every x in there with root 2 over 2 x prime minus y prime. All right, look at the y's. If y is equal to x prime times the sine of theta plus y prime times the cosine of theta, then again, the sine of theta is root 2 over 2. The cosine of theta is also root 2 over 2. And I get y equals root 2 over 2, x prime plus y prime. All right, here comes the long equation. Let's see if all of this will fit on a page. Now I'm going to substitute into the original. So let me write everything out, and then we can start simplifying and pulling things together, and it will simplify nicely at the end. So I started with a 5x squared. So 5 times this thing squared minus 2 times x times y. So 2 times root 2 over 2 x prime minus y prime times root 2 over 2 x prime plus y prime. Right, so there's my minus 2xy plus 5y squared. So I got root 2 over 2, x prime plus y prime squared minus 24 equals 0. All right, let's use the numbers to our advantage here. Root 2 over 2 squared is going to be a 2 on the top and a 4 on the bottom. All right, so can I write this here? If I take root 2 over 2 and square it, I'm going to get a 2 on the top and a 4 on the bottom, which is a half. So when I put a half here, that's where the half came from. Multiply it by 5. And what am I left with? I'm left with an x prime squared minus 2 x prime y prime plus y prime squared. Okay. In the middle here, again, if you notice, I'm multiplying root 2 times root 2 on the bottom 2 times 2, which is 4. So I end up with a 1 half times, this turns out to be a difference of squares pattern. So x prime squared minus y prime squared. And then the last one is going to look like the first one. 5 times 1 half x prime squared plus 2 x prime y prime plus y prime squared. Okay, this is going to run off of your screen, but I promise there's a 24 that I just threw over to the other side. Great. What can I clean up? 5 times 1 half is 5 halves. So I get 5 halves x prime squared. 5 halves times negative 2 is just 5. So minus 5 x prime y prime plus 5 halves y prime squared. Hey, the 2 and the 1 half here cancel out. And don't forget to distribute the negative. So I get negative x prime squared plus y prime squared. The end over here is going to look something familiar. So it's going to be plus 5 halves x prime squared 
5 halves times 2 is 5, so 5 x prime y prime plus 5 halves y prime squared equals 24. Oh, look at that. It's looking better already. Look at this term over here, that term over there. They're the same thing, but they're opposites. So let's get rid of them. What do you have left? You got a whole bunch of x prime squares and y prime squares that need to be combined. So let's see what we've got for x prime squares. We've got an x prime squared here. We've got an x prime squared here. We've got an x prime squared there. So I've got five halves plus another five halves minus one. Well, five halves plus five halves is 10 halves. 10 halves is five. Five minus one is four. Oh, so this whole mess simplifies? It does. All right, so maybe this will make a nice step five. Simplify the mess above. So I get four x prime squared. Now look at my y prime squares. I got a y prime squared over here. I got a y prime squared over here and a y prime squared over here. Similar, but a little different. I got a five halves plus one, plus another five halves. So now I've got 10 halves, which is five plus one. That gives me six. So six y prime squared equals 24. Now, remember the rule for ellipses is you really want a one on the other side, and then you can tell how far to move it along. So let's divide everything through by 24. Divide by 24, divide by 24, divide by 24 which gives me x prime squared over 6 plus y prime squared over 4 equals 1. Now I want to graph this. So I've already figured out it's an ellipse. But how does it graph? Well, let's graph. The first thing is, where are my axes? My axes are at a 45 degree angle. The axis itself is almost at a 45 degree angle. So if I put my vertical and horizontal axes in here, I, clearly I don't have a ruler in my house. Um, 45 degree angle looks like this. So these are my new axes. So this is the x-axis. That's the x-prime axis. That means that's the y-prime axis. How did I get that? I moved it at a 45 degree or a pi over 4 angle. Now, what are my intercepts? Well, if the x prime has intercepts of the square root of 6, remember if it's x prime squared over 6, you take the square root. So the square root of 6 goes where? Well, it's bigger than 2 and it's smaller than 3. So I'm going to put it over here. So the square root of 6 in this direction, square root of 6 in that direction. Now, how about the y's? On the y prime axis, the value underneath the y prime squared was 4, so the square root of 4 is equal to 2. So I should go 2 this way, and I should go 2 that way. So you actually are graphing the ellipse on the same set of rules that you used, I mean, all the way back to pre calc 2, when you were graphing ellipses on x's and y coordinates, except now you're not using the x axis and the y axis as your intercept points anymore. Now you're using the x prime and the y prime axis. So with a little bit of variability for the fact that I don't have a coordinate grid here that gives me exact measures, I've got an ellipse that's rotated that should be longer on the x prime axis and the y prime axis, but not by much, right? The intercepts are square root of 4 versus square root of 6. So in reality, in decimal, we're talking a few tenths between one and the other. All right, I will make a second video for the second application of 4.8, which are Ronskians.